it's Lucy Litch and this is Tiny House Conversations. It's the Australian-based podcast where I interview experienced tiny houses, tiny builders and adventurers in the tiny world so you can discover how to create, build and transition into tiny life. Before we get into the show, I want to let you know about something I feel will be a game changer for aspiring tiny houses and the tiny community as a whole. It's a 3D tiny house designer that my friends at Tiny Easy have recently released. And since you're listening to this podcast to learn more about tiny living, you've probably been envisioning and dreaming about what your own tiny house could look like. Well, Tiny Easy's 3D Tiny House Designer is the first online design tool that lets you design your tiny house without needing any technical or design knowledge. I know for someone like me whose creative strengths are definitely not in design that this is a time and frustration saver. I love that in the designer, I can just drag and drop building blocks to design my tiny house in minutes and then share the design with my friends and tiny house builders. How cool is that? But what's the alternative? Well, I'd literally be sitting here for weeks or maybe even months trying to learn a difficult professional drafting program, or I'd have to hire an expensive architect. All the technical stuff kind of hurts my brain. Can you relate? And I'd rather the money go towards some must-have features in my tiny house. The best thing about the designer is that you can try it out for free and start mocking up your tiny house today. Just choose one of their beautiful tiny house design templates or start from scratch, and let your creativity and imagination run free. Now, if you like the 3D Tiny House Designer, the Tiny Easy team are giving you a super generous 75% off the first month of the premium version, and that includes a ton of more awesome objects, furniture, decorations, materials, and so much more to make your tiny house super special. So just head over to tinyhouseconversations.com forward slash tiny easy designer and use the code Lucy75 to get started. I'll also put a link in the show notes with all the details for you for easy access. And if you haven't heard my tiny house conversation with the tiny easy team, make sure you go check out episode number 22 with Till, Lauren and Eugene. They're doing some amazing things over in New Zealand to help make your tiny house journey easier. And this 3D designer is just the start. Now, let's intro today's episode. Welcome back to another episode of Tiny House Conversations. Today, I'm speaking with Mel Sparkles, who is a tiny houser from the Sunshine Coast in Queensland. With a lifelong passion dedicated to tiny spaces and traditionally being a graphic designer, Mel went on to study building design, interior design, and construction. After helping with other tiny house builds, Mel started building her own tiny house in 2020, which she has recently moved into. Mel hosts the Facebook groups Tiny Houses Brisbane and Queensland and Land and Tiny Houses to Rent or Buy in Australia. Mel has worked as a volunteer for the Australian Tiny House Association for the last four years and has hosted regular tiny house meetings to bring tiny house folk together. Mel has engaged in media spots and participated on speaker panels for tiny houses. She is currently designing another tiny house to build on land that she recently purchased and is navigating the waters with council. And in this conversation, we talk about Mel's story of living in a caravan to building her own tiny house in her 50s and buying her own land, the struggles Mel experienced during the DIY building process, how Mel created the tiny house life she wants to live. We also talked about what tiny living has enabled Mel to do in her life that she couldn't do before, as well as frustrations around council regulations and solutions for the housing crisis, and so much more. This was a really lovely conversation and I feel like Mel has an inspiring story, which you'll get to hear very shortly. So on to this tiny house conversation with Mel. Mel, thanks for joining me on Tiny House Conversations. It's so good to have you here today. Thanks, Lucy. I'm happy to be here. So Mel, you have an interesting story. You've studied interior design and building design and construction And I know that you've also had plenty of experience living in smaller spaces. So you've previously lived in a caravan and now you're living in a tiny house that you actually built yourself quite recently. And I know you're also 
Uh, you just recently bought some land to park it on. But not only that, I know you're also very involved in the tiny house space in Australia. So you're advocating through the Australian Tiny House Association. You do speaking, you do gatherings and, and so many other things. So I'd love to hear about like all of those types of things today. But if we can start first by just taking us back to where your tiny house story started and maybe what inspired you to transition into small space living and then build your own tiny home yourself. I guess that it was just kind of a natural progression. Um, I always been loved small spaces. I, I was living in, in traditional housing and I was probably using about half of the space that I lived in um, and then downstairs I was renting that out. So I was probably actually using a quarter of the space all up. So it just didn't make sense to live like that anymore. So after a little while I moved into the caravan, which was not really the plan, but it kind of just seemed like a good solution at the time. It was affordable. Um, I bought it with a tax return, so it didn't cost me an arm and a leg. Um, and after a few years, I was able to buy a trailer to build a tiny house on wheels and, yeah, just started building. So I've been building it for, it's been a couple of years and I've just moved in. So it's kind of early days for me living in a tiny house, but I'm well and truly used to small spaces. Yeah, and it sounds like I guess the caravan could have been like a stepping stone for you, right, into a, to a tiny house. Oh, definitely. And it was a really good solution. Like I wouldn't kind of go recommending to people to go and you know, take the leap into a caravan because it's pretty radical. Uh, it's a bit of a shock to the system. It definitely served its purpose and it definitely was only a stepping stone for me. It was never something that I'd, I, I never actually thought I'd live in a caravan. I never wanted to, but um, it worked out really well. It was a really great caravan and I've lived on beautiful properties. So, you know, I've been quite lucky in that respect. And you just mentioned there, so being in a caravan was a bit of a shock to the system. So what do you mean by that? Like what were some of the experiences that you had that that were, that made it like that? Um, initially, I didn't have a bathroom. <laughs> so not having a proper bathroom in, in a, you know, close proximity is pretty tricky to navigate. So I ended up building, a, like putting a shower and a toilet in the caravan and that it was a lot more comfortable for me once I got water plumbed in things were a lot better but at first it really was just um, extreme glamping those kind of adjustments winter was really cold even though the caravan was insulated you know so yeah it's just an adjustment but um and and also the stigma of you know living in a caravan um was pretty hard to deal with when I'd come from like a nice area and you know, lived quite well and went to private school and all that sort of stuff. So it was a bit of a, a vast shift for me. But, you know, I knew that the I've, I've had my eye on the prize the whole time. It's interesting you say that. Yeah, there is this perception. There does seem to be this perception around people living in caravans. And I, I feel like the reality is, I know you can't, you, you can't really judge a book by its cover like, you know, some people are having are doing it out of necessity and others choose to live that way. And, and you know, like you, you said as well before, like you only used a quarter of the space you were living in when you were living in a traditional home. And so for some people it, it does make sense and it doesn't, you know, define them as the types of people they are. But I definitely, I, I, I've definitely heard that whole perception and that trailer park type thing. But, yeah, ho hopefully, hopefully that changes over the years, especially with all the housing stuff that's happening at the moment where... I'd be willing to bet that so many people would absolutely love to have a, a, a caravan or something like that where they can live with either themselves or their family or partner or something that are kind of struggling with the, the housing crisis. Yeah, look, it's a really freeing solution. You know, a, 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 it's a, sorry, a freeing situation from traditional housing. If you want to make the leap, it's a great way to do it. Or not a great way, it's a good way to do it. Like it's affordable. Yeah. And quickly, you can do it quite quickly, you know, so so that's, it's a good temporary situation. I mean, some people build decks and, you know, awnings and all that sort of stuff and can make it permanent, permanent. And that's great. Um, but I didn't, ha that was not my plan. So building the tiny house, when I'm in the tiny house, I just feel so much more in alignment with what I'd intended. And the tiny house is, you know, the reason I've done that is so that I can put it on land 
I'll probably build a shed on the land. I bought a little piece of land. Um, I'll build a shed on the land and then I can go away. I'm free. You know, I can put all my stuff in the shed. Like I don't have a lot anymore, but I can leave my stuff in the shed. I can get in my camper van and I can go and do the travel that I've wanted my whole life, you know. So it's it's all kind of part of the the big picture for me. I know for a lot of people that are just discovering tiny houses now or maybe they've kind of heard of it but they don't really know much about it and, and you know, there is more awareness around it now. And, and one of the common questions that I've heard several times is what is the difference between a caravan and a tiny house on wheels? So from your experience and what you know, like what would you say about that? A tiny house on wheels comes under VSB1 standards, which is the caravan standards so um, technically a tiny house on wheels is deemed a caravan according to uh, main roads department of main roads in those respects it is a caravan but obviously it's it's not because it's built differently from a caravan it's built more like a house so it's kind of a combo it's a confused caravan (laughs) (laughs) I love that that's a great description (laughs) So, uh, yeah, yeah, but, you know, like um, it, it definitely feels better to have that structure around me, the solidity of it compared to a caravan because the caravan used to get some pretty nasty shakedowns when the wind came through. Yeah, so it, it is like more structurally sound to have a tiny house and then obviously caravans are often designed to be more movable more often, whereas a tiny house you wouldn't necessarily want to do that. I mean, it depends on the context, of course, and the size and, and all of that, but, yeah. I know that, so we, I mentioned just before, you've done studies in building design, interior design and construction. Uh, are you able to share a bit about the, that, like your experience in those for us? What was that like? I'm a builder. Like since I was a child, I've been building things and I'd always wanted to be a carpenter and I kind of left study, like going to TAFE till way too late. I was about 50 when I went and did a Cert 1 in construction because I couldn't find, I wanted to do woodworking, you know, and I couldn't find anyone to teach me woodworking, the actual craft. Um, so, yeah, I went to TAFE and TAFE were like, you've got, got to get an apprenticeship. And I was 50 at the time and I was too embarrassed to apply for an apprenticeship. So, I just went and did the Cert 1 in construction and I totally lucked in. Like while I was there, we did, our project was a tiny house. So it was, you know, the gods, the universe aligned. (laughs) So uh, I, I helped build this tiny house and it was, we did it from the ground up. It was pretty full on. Then after that, I went and studied building design because I couldn't get into the woodworking side of things. So I thought I'll, I'll go in from, you know, the design side and then find a carpenter to work with me to build tiny houses when I finished that course I I didn't actually complete it I got about three quarters of the way through and I just couldn't get through the end it was really hard and um, I decided to just just do it like I was so sick of all these hard yards to get where I wanted to be Um, so I just started building it you know I just thought I'll just do it and so the caravan was kind of my my trial Uh, my trial project at building so I rebuilt the whole thing except for the skin learnt a lot and so in my tiny house um, it's definitely not perfect but I'm pretty happy with what I've achieved and I think from doing the caravan and a few other projects I've done you know I've got to this point of being able to do a fairly decent build so but, you know, I mean, I just found out the other day a friend of mine who's 76 got an electrical apprenticeship. Oh. Yeah. I'm like, wow, oh, you wow. know, I wish he had to push me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would have loved to have been a carpenter and it's not over yet, you know. You never know. <laughs> Anything's <Definitely>. possible. <laughs> yeah, it's, ne- it's never too late. And I feel like I constantly hear about people you know following their dreams in in their later years and and yeah I think that's really inspiring and and even the fact that you just decided anyway like it's inspiring in itself that you just decided you know what I'm just going to do it because it it's not an easy process and it's and it's a really big project so and with a lot of different parts and you know a lot of um a lot of layers to it and just wanted to commend you on that because even just that decision of just you know 
choosing to do it and then getting on with it and, and doing it and now being able to live in it. That's really cool. And I'm, I'm curious about the building process that you've gone through with your tiny house. So what were some of your biggest challenges during that process? Oh, there's been a few. Um, <laughs> it, it's kind of you just have to, I think, uh, like if I was to offer anyone a tip, the most important thing was be to, would be to do whatever's in front of you. Like if you try to ch- do the whole thing, you'll just cave in with anxiety. I actually, I've got a work in progress board, a blackboard, and I write down all the tiny little tasks that need to be done. So um, I just chip away at them. And then I, I've actually found myself going back and redoing things. So some things I've built that I'm not, happy about and so I've rebuilt them you know like my kitchen cabinets I rebuilt them my bathroom wall I rebuilt my bathroom vanity is an old vintage one that I bought I've rebuilt the back of that so that it fits on the angle of my tiny house about five times now (laughs) (laughs) I I finished it the other day and I'm so happy (laughs) so I think like there's been just so many challenges you know like the, the windows, vintage windows, are such a bugger. Like I think if I was ever to do it again, I wouldn't get vintage windows because <laughs> um, they leak and they crack. <laughs> oh, right. I, look, I repainted them, I repaddied them, I shaved sides off them, I did everything to make them beautiful. And But just they've got a mind of their own. They twist, they don't align with your frame, you know. <laughs> like, so I've learned a lot. And my front doors, which are the most awesome things, they're these lead light vintage doors, flung open the other day and like broke. <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> you just got to let it go you know it's like oh well I'll just fix it <laughs> yeah yeah I mean it's a good attitude to have for sure and, and I can imagine just all those little things would come up and and you know it really shows your persistence too like you're talking about having to do it something five times over and then you finally got it done and I'm also curious what about like did you ever have times where you're like, what am I doing? Like, you know, the mental blockages and the mental challenges of like questioning everything and maybe getting in your own way and even thinking like, am I even good enough to do this? Like, am I capable? Did you go through any of that stuff? Oh, cut to the chase with the am I good enough? Like, you know, am I capable? Uh, I pretty much went to YouTube if I got super stuck and if I really, really couldn't do it, I'd spin out for months <laughs> and then I would ask someone to help me. They wouldn't turn up and then I'd do it. <laughs> so it, it's, been, it's been like so frustrating but so thoroughly rewarding. So, yeah, you know, like it, it, there's been a couple of things where I've got a bit of help in um, and then I've been kind of embarrassed because I thought well, I could have done that. <laughs> so... The doors are, are going to be tricky for me because I think that they really do need to be, um, I think I need new doors <laughs> and um, I'd probably need them built. Yeah, I don't know how that's going to pan out. Yeah, and what and what kinds of things did you get help with then? Like did you do like, what about all the like the electrical and plumbing and all of that kind of stuff? I got, I had a Sparky come in to do the electrical because that's a given. Plumbing, electrical, gas has to be done professionally. Yeah. The frame I farmed out. Uh, the guys that built the frame for me kindly installed it, which I hadn't expected. So I'm actually really glad they did it because it proved to be pretty tricky. The roof, I had a guy come and do the roof and I realised after he spent a week doing it that I could have done it in a day. But, you know, live and learn. Um, <laughs> and uh, I, the, after that I kind of had to redo quite a bit and so that's how I learnt. So going forward, I could easily do a lot more myself. Where I had to farm stuff out, I did, but, you know, I was trying to keep to a budget as well. So, And also I'm really sort of determined to do things myself. So, yeah, a lot of the time I just had to stress out about it for a few nights and months and weeks and whatever and, <laughs> and just that's why it's taken me so long. Yeah, I guess it's part of the process though, isn't it? Like, and then, and then you come back to, oh, I could have just done that myself. And then you, and like you said, for some things you did have to do yourself. So it's like coming back to this, 
this realization, this remembering of the self sufficiency, and you know, it's um, it's really interesting. And are you so are you uh, completely off the grid, or what kind of setup do you have for, for all those things? Um, I've got solar panels, and I've got um, gas hot water system, and like the the pump is run by the solar, mm. and then I've got a water tank, so my water comes from rainwater, and then I do have. Um, power if I want to connect to it so at the moment I've got my fridge connected to 240 volt uh, to mains because it's just stable and reliable and I'm, my solar setup's only really quite basic so that's something I'd like to soup up and eventually be completely off grid so yeah it's it's not that far or that hard for me to achieve that yeah and you're doing the composting toilet yeah yeah I I I sort of had a fight with myself for many years about buying, a, you know, an acrylic or whatever they are, compost toilet for $1,500. And then finally um, I saw a porcelain one that was $1,400 at the last Tiny House Expo and um, just put it on the credit card. <laughs> I just thought, just do it. <laughs> I'm really, really happy with it because it feels like a proper toilet. I, I, I built my own my own compost loose for the last four and a half years. I never had installed a fan, which was such a bad move. <laughs> so <laughs> having a real toilet with a fan is just so nice. And, you know, I'm happy I'm not uh, flushing, that, that water's not getting wasted. So it really is a win-win, a decent compost loo. And did the ones that you built before, were you doing like the bucket type system, like the hum, human newer sort of thing or what kind yeah. of stuff do you have? Yeah. yeah, I had that and then I had, I bought a, the kind of urine diverter from the UK, I think it was, it was a couple of bucks. And that's really worth doing, you know, separating ones and twos because it's just easier to manage that way. And um, also not having the compost bins that I've got now with my new toilet, I was having to dispose of the compost every week. So that meant putting it in the bins, like I was double bagging it, putting it in the bins to go to the tip, you know. So that wasn't good either. I didn't feel good about that. Um, and because I'm not living on my own land at the moment, so I didn't feel good about composting that there. Because I, I had a situation once before where when I moved, they asked me to dig a huge area up with the compost. <laughs> so I never, ever want to subject myself back to that again. Oh, <laughs> oh no. And, and the, the composting toilet that you have now, the one that you got at the Tiny Homes Expo, um, are, are you okay to share with, like, which one it is? Because people are all, that's one of the most common questions always asking, like, which ones, what kind? Um, yeah, yeah, cool. Um, I bought it from EcoFlow. Yeah. EcoFlow? Yeah, I think it's EcoFlow. And it's um, called the Pasadera. I think the actual pan is the Pasadera. It's porcelain. Mm. And then the compost chambers are Nature's Lou. Oh, yes. Yeah. So that wasn't the right pack. That wasn't the package they had for sale, but I asked for this, the switch from the toilet they had on display because I didn't like it. If I was going to pay that kind of money, I wanted what I wanted. Yeah. So they mixed a kit up for me and it ended up being the Passadero, which is kind of egg-shaped, which is really nice, a normal toilet seat and then the compost chambers, which are nature's loo. Yeah, so that, so then you've got a split system, right, so that the, the chamber's underneath the floor? Yeah, yeah, it's under the floor and um, I was going to get, I think it's called Clivus Maltram, and yep. that's the one where it's got the handle and you can turn the compost, which would have been a good idea, but it was so much more expensive. So I ended up going without the one where you can turn the compost and it's a bit gross, but I decided to make sure it was all on track the other day. So I removed <laughs> it and it's all okay, but I, I just shook it and moved it around to level it all out. And um, it, it wasn't nasty or anything. I mean, of course it is, but it wasn't super nasty because it's been aerated for so yeah. for like the last few months. So the fan is just definitely the bee's knees. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I think that's like one thing that's, that's definitely essential for having a composting toilet set up is that, that exhaust yeah. fan. Yeah. yeah. And you have to be brave to take on a compost loop. <laughs> it's a whole different thing. 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I'm, I'm going to be doing that for my my own tiny home, and and I, I've I've used different ones over the years at different places, and yeah, it is it is just a way to, I guess, be involved in the process, you know, of of how and be more responsible with with our resources and our own um, organic matter and and all of that too. So. Yeah, and that's um that's it's always good to get like recommendations too because I know that everyone has different needs, different situations, different contexts, and and some people might do well with a self-contained one. Others might need a split system, and then all the different brands. If you're not going to build on your own, it's always good to get yeah other people's experiences. And I'm curious, what size is your tiny house? Um, it's six meters by two point four. 2.4. So it's pretty small, but I, I angled the ends out. And because they're angled out, the loft feels like it's bigger. Mm-hmm. Like it's, it's, there's more volume than 6 by 2.4. Is the loft the sleeping loft, or are you um, doing the storage loft and then a ground, ground full of bedroom? Or? Um, it is a sleeping loft, but I'm kind of thinking that I might have a day bed for the lounge. I haven't finished building the lounge yet. But I want to make it day bed size because um, I mean I'm I am used to going up and down the loft now, but I kind of think that I want to use the loft for storage, office, and like a, a lounge hangout kind of space because I you know getting up through the night, having a hot chocolate, or going to the loo or whatever, going up and down the little ladder is a little bit scary. Yeah. So, <laughs> but you know I'm managing okay. But I kind of think it might be better if I was to um, sleep downstairs. But at the moment it's all okay. Yeah, good to have options, I suppose. Ideally, I think my plan is to build a second one um, and then I'd have that as the bedroom and wardrobe, you know, where my clothes are stored. Mm. So then I have the main one as my living space and then the other one as my sleeping space. Yeah, and did you did you build in much creative storage you know how like in a lot of the tiny houses you see lots of different things that are multi-purpose or different fun- like multi-functional and efficient use did you do that for yourself no I kind of um under the stairs there's an opportunity to do that but I haven't really I've, I've put a ladder in and there's you know a good sort of space under the stairs so uh, under the ladder so that's something I'm still getting my head around about what to do I've kind of left that that's a tricky bit that's a hard bit for me to design because I'm going to design the platform that goes into the loft as well there's a little drop down platform so yeah I'm kind of leaving that as a project for later um but I'm building storage under the lounge but um, besides that I don't have a lot of storage in there so which is a bit because I do have a lot of shoes I did I did do a little (laughs) drop down (laughs) I did do as you walk in the door there are two bays that I did that are drop down so I finished them off yesterday, so that's super exciting. So now oh. all my, because I live on a farm, so all my farm shoes can go in there. And <laughs> nice. Other shoes can go somewhere where they're not going to get farm mud on them. <laughs> yeah, for <laughs> sure. Oh, that that's good. That's good. And did you did you create the design and plans and everything for your home yourself, or what was that uh, process like yeah. for you? Yeah, yeah, I um kind of had about three main designs and the third one oh, oh sorry I'll dial it back a bit the yeah. caravan that I lived in had the perfect design so that's what I modeled the tiny house on and then I kind of just started to massage that into what would work for me with a loft I ended up designing this super cool little tiny house and it was square like the ends were squared off and once I dropped those down and angled them it was perfect so yeah it was a bit of mucking around um now that I'm in it there are a couple of things I would do differently like move the doors away from the wall you know the front doors I'd leave enough room for a double bed so you know the width of the bed I would leave that space to the right of the door or the left of the door or whatever So that was kind of a bit of a mistake because that would be ideal to have um, a bed that goes up and down, Yeah, you know, a retractable bed. So that would have been perfect. Everything else is pretty good. Like there's a few little things that aren't perfect, but, yeah, no, I think it's it's working pretty well. Did you – you were talking about the caravan codes before. So how did you find that process of of working – 
the, making sure that you were kind of working with the caravan codes and those types of things as you were building? Well, with the tiny house, I, um, I, I don't know, really. I, I just built everything as close to code as I possibly could. Yeah, I, I guess from building the tiny house in the construction course, I just kind of adapted that yeah. with my build and researched everything else I needed to um, to do everything properly. Are you okay to share like the overall or the running cost of because you've obviously done a DIY build which would save you a lot of money out of labour and all of that? Are you okay to share like a range of how much it might have cost you to do your own DIY build? I really don't know where I'm up to to be honest. I kind of stopped counting at about twenty grand because I mean I've done it on the cheap and I've waited for materials to come to me rather than buy things that were expensive at the time for convenience and to save time and because of that I've saved a lot of money the vintage windows saved me about five grand oh wow so that's a massive saving Um, but I you know just choosing a bit better next time (laughs) be a good idea especially with the doors I mean that's going to be an expensive thing so I think I'm look I guess 30 grand 40 grand maybe that's great, if in, even if it's around that or even a bit above. Like, that's pretty That's pretty good, you know. I'd say I'm way below it. It'd be up to up to 40 grand. I mean, it's worth heaps more with the, the crafting that I've put into it because I've used some beautiful hardwood timbers. Mm. It's, it's definitely a little on the heavy side. She's going to be a bit of a heavy girl. <laughs> 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 but the plan is to only sort of, you know, move to the land and, not be on the road a lot so and what what did you do to personalize it like what kind of features were you like okay I really have to have this or this is something this kind of style or just any kind of personal personalization that you did that's really the essence of you I suppose repurposing things was my main thing like the kitchen cupboards were these old vintage kitchen cupboards that I rebuilt everything's kind of got that behind it you know, like the windows and the doors. I carted these amazing windows around with me for like such a long time, probably 10 years, maybe even longer. <laughs> and they, they were yellow, like the, you know, the border, the, the frame was yellow and the inside of them is this pink floral glass. Like it sounds hideous, but, oh, my God, when the sun comes through those in the morning, it's just spectacular. Like my loft is like bathed in pink light. And, like, in that moment, I'm like, oh, my God, I've achieved exactly what I wanted. So, yeah, there's things like that, you know, that, that have a lot of meaning to me. I mean, I know it's just a thing, but it's a thing I like. <laughs> so, yeah. And I think it's okay to have, like, our comforts and, you know, put a personalised spin on there. And and I, I guess sometimes, I, I mean, I've spoken about this, like, a fair bit on the podcast and even just to people offline is like there is this whole like minimalist thing around tiny house living but it doesn't always have to be like that for, for everyone and it's nice to have your own your own little own little features and things that, that you like or that really speak to you and that mean something so I, I love that and I'm curious as well so in terms of small space living is there anything that maybe has, is not working for you or has been a big challenge? Like I know you talked about initially when you are in the caravan, it was like those basic things like the toilet and all of that. But is there anything else that, that comes to mind? You know, a set of stairs would have been better. And I do, I, I've got this old like Japanese Tanzu bookshelf that I've reconfigured and it's, it is a set of stairs, but it's so heavy. <laughs> so <laughs> I opted out of that and put the ladder in. And also I had a dog when I was building and she was arthritic. So the stairs were mainly for her to get up and down. She, she moved on a, a, about a year ago and I just thought it's probably quicker and easier to throw a ladder in. So I'm kind of not really um, 100% on the ladder um, and that could be changed later. I could put the, the Tanzu stairs in, bookshelf in. So there's that. Um, and then the bed situation, like to have a bed going up and down, downstairs, you know, raising up would have been, I think, perfect. But, um, I mean, it is pretty good, you know. Like I'm probably about 95% of everything I wanted. Yeah, I've achieved about 95% of what I sort of thought it initially was going to happen. 
maybe making it a little bit bigger might have been a good solution for storage. But, yeah, I don't know. It works pretty well for me. Yeah, I mean, 95% is great. <laughs> that's, yeah, yeah. That's really good. Yeah. yeah pretty up uh, the creek. I met someone that was really tall, though, because <laughs> her loft is really short. <laughs> yeah. I guess it's it's hard to I've, – I've talked to people about this before as well as, like, future-proofing a tiny home for things like that, whether it's relationships or family or whatever it might be or, or just different life circumstances. It's, it's, it's always interesting because, like, for uh, my tiny house – it will be ready really soon and it's also a six metre tiny and I chose that at the end of last year and then it's been this process of going through and making all these different different decisions and what I found is sometimes I do go maybe should I have gone like a little bit bigger and should I have like put more storage here or should I have done that and it's it's always hard to, to for it to be a hundred percent and then especially when time goes on and maybe you you change in some way or something is just different for you or you have different needs it can always change change but I think the good thing about it is as well as you can always add things later or you can do things differently or like you said you could maybe build another one if you wanted to do that if you're that way inclined and so you'd have you're talking about like storage and another bedroom and all of that so I think there's like lots of different things that you can do even if you don't get it 100% um, which I don't think is always going to be super realistic anyway for it to be 100% all the time so oh definitely you can't sort of get something like everything out of one thing you know for me thinking about the next build like building that bedroom I think is um a good plan for the future but as I said I bought land so um I'm not 100% sure what I'm doing with that you know so I don't know if the tiny will actually end up getting there like there's so many ifs and buts and possibilities and maybe so Mm. um, at the moment the tiny is perfect for me and I, I kind of, I, I was getting stuck in something the other day about making the tiny perfect, you know, making sure I had this. And then I just went, I'll get over it. Like just, you know, it's good. <laughs> like it's good how it is. <laughs> and so, and we do, we get really stuck in that perfectionism of wanting it to be everything, wanting it to be perfect. Yeah, it was a, it was a good realisation the other day. I was just like, it's bloody good. Like just just move forward (laughs) totally totally it's the the funny what the mind does it kind of uh it's it's almost it's never enough right and then when you actually take a step back and and reflect and see the bigger picture you're like it's actually really amazing like what I have or what I've created or what this is so yeah it's a really good reminder I it's hard to the perfectionism the perfectionism thing is a real thing and I I think that it is a really great lesson on this tiny house journey whether you're DIY building or you're going through a building company and you're going through that design process and like trying to cover every single little base and even thinking about but you know what is it going to be like in the future like what if I need this or what if I need this and it just yeah it does get really stressful so I think it's yeah it's good for people to know that you know you can you can make things work and you can adapt and you can add and take away things later so that that's um that's really good and I'm also wondering for you since whether it's living in a caravan or maybe even just living in your tiny house now and going through this journey, what has tiny or small space living enabled you to do in your life that maybe you weren't able to do before? Well, I'm living on on 53 hectares at the moment. My neighbours are cows and sheep <laughs> and horses mm-hmm. and they're just just so beautiful, you know, like I love nature. And when I was living in traditional housing, my neighbours were like heavily into drugs and there was a lot of crime in the area and and it was just really, just dragged me down. You know, so now in the morning I wake up, I wake up really, really early because I start work early and I get up and the sun's rising and the horses are just staring at the sun and like looking up and and milling around and it's just like that's just so worth it you know, that sort of serenity and peace. So I think that's the um, the, the upside is that um, that's what I've allowed myself to have. Uh, I'm still crazy busy though and that's sort of something I've had my whole life so I'm trying to learn not to do that. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, that's going to just take a bit of time. So... <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Especially when I've like, been doing for something for such a long time, it does take a while to you know, realize or just learn how to not take on so much, not say yes to everything, have boundaries, you know, to, to protect your energy and, and have space and all of that. So, yeah, I think, I think for probably, I dare say most of us, or many of us that are living in this modern Western type lifestyle, that that's always a continual lesson again and again, and then you forget, and then you have to remember it and learn it again. So, yeah. And what about like on the, but on the same wavelength wavelength is that is there anything that you've been able to stop doing in your life since you've transitioned into tiny living i i went back and studied so that was the one of the best things i i studied building design and interior design twice oh <laughs> and, wow <laughs> um, so i had the luxury to do that because i was saving so much money on rent and bills because when you live tiny you generally just pay you know, rent and bills all in one, um, you know, in one payment kind of thing. Like you don't have to, well, I've never, I haven't had to do that. I've always just paid, you know, X amount of money, which covers all my bills, like rent and electricity and water. Um, so that freed me up quite a bit, you know, financially. So I, I was able to go back to study and, yeah, just rethink what I wanted to do. And I found for the last few years that I've just been doing what I want to do. And I haven't had to work full time, but I, lucked in and found a full-time job about a year ago and it pays really well and I've been able to get materials from work from my build and for my project I'm building on my land um so so it's kind of funny it's funny I'm kind of in reverse now like (laughs) all of a sudden I've got a bit of a mortgage it's not very big and I'm working full-time yeah it's it's kind of it's funny I kind of have a bit of a laugh at my life every so often but it is by design like it's it's all what I've created I'm happy doing what I'm doing so I I just never thought I'd see myself going back to full-time work you know at 58 kind of thing but here I am and it's all working so I, I really can't complain yeah and I think that you're by the sounds of it you're living this very intentional life and you're living the way that you want to live you know you're, you've been able to buy your own land and build your own tiny house and I think yeah and sometimes you just got to do what you got to do for a certain period of time and and, and that's okay and yeah it's a, it's it's really inspiring and it's lovely to hear just like what I guess moving into a tiny house or just living this lifestyle or living with this type of mindset is able to create space for even if your life day to day might be a little bit full it sounds like you're living in a in a different way and a, a way that's more aligned for you and and how you want to want to live instead of doing what you've been told you should be doing or achieving some ideal so that's that's really inspiring yeah yeah it's been um very liberating very freeing but I mean, you know, the caravan cost me twelve hundred dollars. I didn't have a lot of money, and I, and that's kind of enabled me to, like, create the tiny house, and all the components of the tiny house I bought when I could afford to do it. So I didn't have a great water cash behind me or anything like that. I did do it on a shoestring. Now I'm just kind of topping everything up because I've got a job again. So um, it, it it's all part of the journey. Like I've just been lucky to have the space and freedom to go back to full-time work. I think before I was too stressed out to work full-time. <laughs> and now that I've got space, um, you know, the job came to me and I was able to take it on and, and do it without any drama. So, yeah, it's kind of funny the way it um, unfolded. <laughs> <laughs> life has life has greater plans I love it never it never goes according to how we well not never but it, it can often go according to different differently to maybe how we expect it or how we might have planned and I, I'm wondering as well Mel so is there a common misconception that you hear about living in a tiny house oh, I think like it, like on the topic of design, like I know that's not what you're asking me, but when you design your tiny house and when you live in it, it's completely different. Like mm-hmm. what you think it's going to feel like and what it does feel like is vastly different. With your design, when you've got your design, um, imagine you're a little tiny person <laughs> and you're standing in that design and, you know, walk around your design in your head and just see what that actually feels like. 
because um, I, I was just kind of imagining what I was imagining and what it turned out were very different. Like the feeling of those spaces. Like, for example, I designed my bathroom far too small. <laughs> so it's about a metre or maybe even 900 wide by 2.25. Big mistake. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, I've nearly knocked myself out so many times um, by my, <laughs> my cupboard on the wall above the toilet. So that's going. <laughs> um, and I just had to cut the vanity in half because it was jutting out and I bought a big vintage Japanese bath and getting out of it is almost um, like really dangerous. <laughs> so, so I've had to, yeah, you know, you really, really think through the safety aspects of such a small space. Yeah, like, you know, make sure that there's room and, and there's new... Um, compliance or regulations rules or whatever coming out with the ncc with building codes so um, they're suggesting that in front of a toilet that you've got 900 by 1200 space i don't know if they're going to be able to apply it to a tiny house but that's what they're recommending there's a few kind of odd things coming out of that so if anyone's building at the moment have a bit of a read up and see how that um, sits for them yeah Um, the national construction code yeah, 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 yeah. Luckily, um, tiny houses are still under BSB1, which is a caravan standards, so they're not expected to comply with those. But, yeah, who knows what the future holds? And it's better to build your house to code as best as possible for the future, you know, if you wanted to put it on land and live on it as your dwelling. Exactly, exactly. And do you, just on that, do you, being like a big advocate of tiny houses yourself and doing work with the Australian Tiny House Association. How, where are we at or what's your feeling on the progression of, say, regulations? I mean, I've done a podcast with El Payton a little while ago on the regulations and the situation. I know that things are changing uh, all the time or at least AFA is working alongside um, trying to push for a lot of different things. So what's your feeling on tiny houses and them becoming a bit more or a bit less of a grey area, let's say? Um, I, look, I, I'm not feeling that hopeful at the moment, <laughs> unfortunately, because um, I just haven't seen any headway. We've done so much work to make tiny houses more palatable to council. I, I just can't feel anything changing. Like I haven't seen or felt any changes for years now. And I, I'm, I personally feel very frustrated with it. So I... I just hope, you know, that um, council sort of starts to have a look at the situation because there's 14,000 people on the Sunshine Coast at the moment where I live that are homeless and they're just normal people. You know, they're just people that um, couldn't afford their bills because of COVID or whatever, 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 and they've found themselves homeless. So if council allowed people to um, live in tiny houses or, you know, buses or whatever and every third person shared their house with someone, the problem would be almost eliminated. Yeah, I'm very frustrated at the moment with the whole thing. Yeah, it'd just be really nice to see one council stand up and say, okay, we're cool with it, let's do it. You know, we'll trial you out for two years. And um, I, I know, like, it's very important to get your wastewater right with a tiny house or a caravan or a bus or whatever. So I think... If that was an easier solution, um, it would be easier for the council to allow it. So I, I think that really is um, a sticky point for for the whole situation. If someone out there is has got some awesome design and it's affordable, they need to sell it to the council. The compost loo is fantastic. Like that, that's a huge relief to the whole scenario for my tiny house setup. But um, getting a really good grey water and uh, what's it called, grease trap in for the kitchen waste, um, that's council approved that you can buy and put under or next to or in your tiny house, or obviously under it, not in it, would be sort of like so fantastic. And then all they do is they tick it off and they're like, yep, you're cool, you know, like you're not going to ruin your land. You're using the right device. Yeah, I think it's, I know that sounds really simple, but that's what I've kind of, 
seen over the years or concluded. Yeah, well, yeah. they they want to know that you're managing those those things properly and you're not going to, you know, do damage to the land and all of that. So it is it is fair enough. And I'm just curious on that, like what have you done for your own situation with, I mean, you said you've got the composting toilet, what about grey water and, and that kind of set up? Yeah, I've, I've had my plumbing roughed in and they haven't finished it. I've had a problem finding a plumber who will sign off. So that's been going on for a few months now. So I'm using, um, it, it is running off into a reed bed, the wastewater. I'm using all biodegradable products. So at the moment it's okay, but I really need, I, I've bought some tanks for grey water and fresh water. So um, that's about to be set up. So that's what I'll be doing. I'll be running it into a grey water tank and then into a reed bed. Okay, good to know, good to know. And I know that you're so like with the advocacy work that you've been doing, I know you've mentioned before that you were part of like creating a letter for people to take to councils if they're deciding to go through their local council uh, with their own parking space and their tiny home for long-term purposes. So can you share a bit more about that? About four or five years ago, we drafted up a letter. This was through um, one of the Facebook groups I host, host Tiny Houses Brisbane and Queensland. So a few people got together and drafted the letter and um, it was to take to your council so that you could have a discussion about where you stood with Tiny Houses. I didn't get a lot of feedback from it, so I don't know if people were doing it. So we were drumming it up for quite a while, for a couple of years. Um, APA, Australian Tiny House Association, redrafted it, and so that is actually available on their website. So I, I don't know where we are at with that, though. We, I don't know if that was kind of the solution because council were kind of not listening. Uh, council are fully aware that, you know, there's many, many, many thousands of people that want another solution. Don't really know where that's at now. It is It is really frustrating because just like you said, up where you are, like 14,000 people or something, it's similar down, I don't know the number, but I know down on the south coast of New South Wales where I am, there's a lot of, uh, there's been, you know, homelessness as well. And it's just really sad to see. And you no, know, it is going to, I don't know what it's going to take. And, you know, it's because every council is obviously every state and then every council has a different interpretation of of legislation and then they they handle and perceive and and enforce things differently as well and some councils are a bit more friendly and then others are completely not and so it's yeah it is frustrating but I'm hoping that as the tiny house movement continues to grow over the years and it definitely is growing especially when you go to the tiny homes expos now like the you know each time there seems to be a lot more people and and I think it's the awareness is spreading so I, I I guess yeah we'll have to wait and see what happens but I think the work that you're doing and you know with the Australian Tiny House Association it's really important especially during this time yeah well I mean we've been at the tipping point for years now I mean I understand why they haven't sort of approved tiny house living legally because of the wastewater like I'm mm-hmm. guessing that that's what the problem is. Um, but, yeah, they just, I mean, if they need to jump in and give us a hand because yeah. if they had this solution, you know, or could help us with the solution for the wastewater, then there'd be no problems really. I mean, people are living alternatively anyway and they have done for many, many, many decades, you know. So I just think they need to um, just move forward. Definitely, definitely. Yeah. And Mel, so you mentioned just before your one of your Facebook groups. Do you want to let everyone know like where the best places they can come and find you? So if you want to share like your different Facebook groups, website, social media, or anything like that. The main page that I've been hosting for about seven or eight years is Tiny Houses Brisbane and Queensland. Um, and it is an Australia-wide group. We've got people from all around the world as well, so it's not just specifically Brisbane and Queensland. It kind of started off as that because we were doing meetings regularly in Brisbane, So, but, yeah, everyone's welcome to join. The other group I host is Land and Tiny Houses to Rent or Buy in Australia. So that's if you're looking for land um, or you've got land to share or you want to buy a tiny house or um, rent a tiny house. 
so that's a free page as well. There's no cost involved in in the service, so it's a it's well worthwhile. Um, my personal page for my tiny house build is slice of tiny pie, so it's P A I, which means goodness in Maori. So yeah, that's about it. I've got a couple of other pages too. I do some tiny house merch, but I'm, I'm kind of not really focused on that at the moment. Gosh, you do so many things. <laughs> it's so it's so good. Well, I will put a link to to all of those contacts in the show notes, and also I'll put a link to. So we were talking before about the council letter that you mentioned. We talked about the National Construction Code as well as I have the episode with El Payton on the regulation, so I'll put all of those in the show notes as well. Um, Mel, as we start to close out the conversation today, is there anything that you wanted to leave our listeners with, anything at all, whether it's some words of inspiration around tiny house living or, or anything that you feel called to share? I can't remember the name of it, the Japanese, like, thing for if you've Might made a mistake. Yeah, I think it's that. Well, you know, human error is fine, basically. So if you stuff something up, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Move forward. <laughs> you can fix it later. So that that's really important. And I walk around my house and I see my human error everywhere and I and I smile. I think, <laughs> what is that? <laughs> you know, so that's really good. Uh, the other thing is don't uh, try to do everything at once, you know, just chip away at it. Like that's really important. So the working progress board is really important. When you've got there, when you've achieved it and you're resting up in your tiny house after you've built it or you've had it built, like you'll probably go through a few stages and I think it's really important to just just chill, you know, and like allow all those stages. Like you might not like it, you know, you might think it's not really what you wanted. Like just give it a go, like give it some time. And it is stressful. The whole process is very stressful to get it built or build it, build it yourself. So. It does take time to come down off that to enjoy what you've created. I like how you talked about allowing and the different stages especially because I think, and actually everything that you just said there, we can apply that to everything that we do in our lives, right? Not just whether it's tiny house living, it's in it's in our relationships, it's in the decisions that we make, it's in just the everyday that we move through life. It, it, there's always it's always great to to remember these little things. So I, I really appreciate you saying all of that and. I uh, just want to say as well, Mel, thank you so much for your time. It's been really great to to get to know you a bit more and hear your story. And, you know, I think it's really inspiring how you've kind of gotten to where you are now and you've just built your own tiny house and funny that you're already thinking about your next project. But, of course, that's all, that's always the way, isn't it? And so thank you so much for your time and energy today and thank you for being here. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks for having me. I really enjoyed it. <laughs> yeah, me too. My pleasure. And if you're listening to us at home, make sure you go check out what Mel is doing. So the different Facebook groups and, and Slice of Tiny Pie, I'll put all the link in the episode show notes at tinyhouseconversations.com. And thank you for your presence and for listening to the show as always. Stay tuned every Thursday for new episodes of Tiny House Conversations. And I'll see you next week. Thanks again for listening and if you enjoyed the conversation today, you found it valuable and you want to support the podcast, the best way you can do that is to share the love. That way I can keep bringing you more tiny house conversations to help you on your own tiny journey. So here are three ways that you can support the podcast. Number one, if you have a friend or family member that you feel would benefit from hearing these conversations, feel free to share it with them, email them, text them, send them a telegram, do whatever you need to do to share it with them. Number two, if you hit the subscribe button, you'll know exactly when the next episode is live. And number three, if you head on over to Apple Podcasts or wherever you're listening to podcasts and leave a five-star rating and review. Thank you so much in advance. I appreciate you and I'll see you in the next episode.